We come to a tremendously important topic today, obviously, and why God allows evil. What kind of introduction can I give it uh, in brief? Well, let me just start by saying here's what we're going to do in the class. We are going to examine every major problem related to why God allows evil. We're going to examine essentially all of the all of the big problems and in other words we're going to not only examine why we suffer for Adam's sin we're also going to uh, examine uh, the oppression of women and whether Christianity is oppressive to women uh, crusades and inquisitions and witch hunts we're going to talk about the fairness of hell and the destiny of the unevangelized and so on in other words we're going to go through the whole gamut uh, of what is uh, going on when it comes to What's God doing in the universe? We're going to, I'm going to be staying scriptural. I hope you will find that there is no time that I'm deviating from the Word of God. I am, however, going to make speculations occasionally. I will label those as speculations, however, you understand. I don't think it's wrong to speculate uh, as long as you say, uh, this is my speculation. Don't build a doctrine on my speculation. Uh, it's, it, but this is, I'm going to give you a number of things where I think this is what God, in fact, is doing in the universe. The entirety of my theodicy, by the way, and what I'm going to present to you as a theodicy, isn't dependent upon those speculations. You understand? In other words, the basic, the basic theodicy that I'm going to be presenting uh, is not going to, wow, but if this one thing we're speculating, which Scripture doesn't really say, if that wasn't true, then the whole theodicy's off. That's not going to happen. Uh, I, where I speculate occasionally is going to be just to kind of give you a little bit more uh, of something to think about in this or that regard. I'm going to really encourage everyone to look very, very, very deeply into a lot of topics. I've learned over the years been teaching this every twice a year now for years I've learned over the years that Christians pay lip service to a lot of doctrines what we say we believe and what we really believe are often very different for instance we I think everyone in here if I said to you do you believe that Christian or that people are born sinful and that people are very sinful I think everybody in here would probably say oh yes uh, the reason I assigned uh, Ordinary Men Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland was to have you get a deeper grasp of what it means to say that people are sinful. And so we're going to look deeply at a lot of these doctrines. We're going to pay a lot. We're, we're not just going to give them a surface treatment. Overall, by the way, I'm making an appeal to what is called the greater good theodicy. And by that I mean, why does God allow evil? God allows evil because it's a greater good for him to allow evil than for him to disallow evil and then to um, also do away with free will. So it's a greater good for God to allow evil than for him to do away with all evil. And of course we have to do some serious unpacking of that and we will. <clears throat> I already talked to you about your term paper so I will leave that alone uh, now. Here's how I got into this. As a young, young pastor in the early 80s, that way I don't have to tell you how many years it was, I'll just say in the early 80s I was a young pastor starting out life, struggling in many ways. My, my, my early life frankly wasn't that easy to be very candid with you and I'll talk more about some of the difficulties throughout the class that I've gone through in life everything from we weren't able to have kids to dealing with my own uh, my own run-in with cancer we'll talk about these things but anyway as a young pastor <clears throat> in the early 80s I think 1981 the Lord began to reveal to me I began to get a glimpse of the glory that awaits us in heaven and as I began to understand that frankly it was it was no less than life-changing 
I mean, it was and is today still completely and utterly life-changing as I began to really understand the wonder, the privilege, the glory of what it means to be a Christian. And so as a young pastor, I taught on this, well, just about every chance I could get. Um, and the people that heard me at that time would have known that many of my sermons were about the wonder of what it means to be a Christian. <clears throat> you see, because we Christians, it's not just that you've been forgiven of your sins. A lot of times, uh, Christians will, or Pastors or theologians will sometimes say, hopefully pastors more than theologians, but hopefully those that really study this would know better, will say, well, we're just forgiven sinners. Oh, you're much more than a forgiven sinner. That does not do it justice. If Christianity is true, you've not only been forgiven of your sins, but you've been adopted into God's family. Uh, because you've been adopted to into his family, you're going to inherit all things, you're not only going to live forever, but he's going to glorify you. And you're going to reign with Christ. And reign means what you think it means. And we're going to talk about that. Our last class together, we're going to talk about your reigning with Christ. You're going to reign with Christ forever and ever. He's giving you, as, as Jesus said in Luke, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's giving you the kingdom so that you can do with it what you would like to do. And as I began to unpack this, it, frankly, I, I don't know how else to put it to say other, other than to say it just completely changed my life, drastically changed my life. It gave me more joy in life. It freed me, frankly, from a lot of the lusts of this world. It gave, revealed to me my purpose and what was going on. And as I taught on these things and as I studied these things, it was amazing to me because something else began to occur. As the years went on, I went, okay, I see what God is doing, has done for us in Jesus' work on the cross and how he saved us, how we've been adopted to his family. We're even right, the bride of Christ, and we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. But not only is there all of that, but then I started thinking, but where did we come from? It, I felt kind of inside like, okay, now I understand where I'm, who I am now, and I understand what God's eternal future is for me and us, the believers. But I started thinking, well, what is it? What, was, what is the non-Christian like? And I think partially at first I just studied it as a contrast. It was sort of like, oh, let's just see what, it, what I was like before that. And so I really began to study what it is like to be without Christ, the nature of the unbeliever the nature of the person who does not know Jesus and how lost they are and how darkened they are, as the scripture says, in their understanding, separated from the life of God, uh, and indeed, mired in sin. And as I really began to come to grips, and we're going to talk about that starting tonight, and then next week we're going to talk about that a lot, is what it means to be mired in sin. But as I understood as I really began to grasp and get a hold of what it means to be glorified with Christ, and, and then when I began to understand where I came from, which was out of the spiritual gutter, as I began to understand these things, the problem of evil largely went away. The problem of evil just largely went away. It was almost like I went, I get it. Now, I realize for some of you, and people that might be watching this uh, on the internet might be going, that is an amazing claim. Well, stick with me and we'll, we'll talk this out. We have many hours, I'm thankful to say, to, to begin to unpack this. So, and, and there, I just mentioned two major doctrines. The understanding of who you were without Christ and the understanding of what God is going to do with you. And so D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, famous preacher of Westminster Chapel in London, put it this way, most of our troubles are due to the fact that we are guilty of a double failure. We fail on the one hand to realize the depth of sin, and on the other hand, we fail to realize the greatness and the height and the glory of our salvation. He's absolutely right. By the way, I didn't say this in the introduction, but I should say it now. Please feel free to ask me questions at any time. Uh, please do not let the cameras... Uh, 
they will probably cut you out, frankly. Uh, they, they already told me that they will probably cut out uh, questions and just go on. But so don't hesitate, though, uh, to ask any questions as you feel so inclined. Uh, that's one of the values of actually sitting in the classroom, right, where you can go, I don't get it. Uh, and we can talk it out. But, he, but Lloyd-Jones is absolutely correct here. This is, man, do I, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Most of our problems are due to a double failure. We fail to understand the mire that we came out of, and we fail to understand the glory that God's bringing us into. So let's start talking about the problem of evil a little bit more specifically. As an introduction, Sam Harris, in Letter to a Christian Nation, wrote, Somewhere in the world, a man has abducted a little girl. Soon he will rape, torture, and kill her. If an atrocity of this kind is not occurring at precisely this moment, it will happen in a few hours or days at most. The same statistics also suggest that this girl's parents believe, as you believe, that an all-powerful and all-loving God is watching over them and their family. Are they right to believe this? Is it good that they believe this? No. The entirety of atheism is contained in this response. And of course, many of you already know Sam Harris is one of the, the quote-unquote new atheists. I think a little bit, I, I wonder a little bit if Sam Harris didn't, wouldn't like to take that back. Does he really want to say the entirety of atheism is contained in that response? Because that means if you answer the problem of evil, I guess atheism's over, right? Because he said the entirety of it uh, is uh, contained in this response. Daniel Howard Snyder put it, No authoritative Christian source holds forth that we should expect to be able to understand why God would permit so much evil rather than a lot less. Indeed, the biblical message is that we have no business thinking we can do anything of the sort. We do others a grievous disservice to hold out to them in private or in the pulpit any expectation to understand why God would permit so much evil or any particular instance of it. Uh, ex expectations which we have no reason to believe will be fulfilled. Expectations when left unfulfilled can become nearly irresistible grounds for rejecting the faith. We are in the dark here. We can't see how any reason we know of or the whole lot of them combined would justify God permitting so much horrific evil or any particular horror. We need to own up to that fact. Frankly, I just completely and utterly disagree. And I just encourage you to stick with me and let's, let's, open up, let's open up this topic. Bart Ehrman says he left the Lord. He used to be an evangelical. And by the way, on my blog, uh, some of all of you have probably heard it at one time or my mentioning it at claydjones.net, claydjones.net. On my blog, uh, I have just done 22 blogs on Bart Ehrman's book, God's Problem. Uh, the full title is God's Problem, How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer. Uh, Ehrman wrote, I realized that I could no longer reconcile the claims of faith with the facts of life. In particular, I could no longer explain how there can be a good and all-powerful God actively involved with this world, given the, given the state of things. For many people who inhabit this planet, life is a cesspool of misery and suffering. I came to the point where I simply could not believe that there's a good and kindly disposed ruler who is in charge of it. I've now lost my faith altogether. I no longer go to church. I no, no longer believe, no longer consider myself a Christian. So obviously we've got some people saying, you can't answer the problem of evil and this is a good reason not to be a Christian. And Bart Ehrman says, I used to be a Christian, but now I've given it up because the Bible can't answer why we suffer. And uh, if you want to see my response, 22 blogs on it. I, I'm, I have one concluding blog and I'm done. So let's talk about briefly, and I assigned to you John Feinberg's book, The Many Faces of Evil. He talks about this somewhat. The difference, that's Leibniz, right? Uh, and uh, he had uh, very good hair. Uh, in the, he, he was the one that came up with the term theodicy. And a theodicy comes from the Greek theos for God and DK for justice. And a theodicy in t attempts to explain God's true reasons for allowing evil. In other words, that's different than a defense. As Ronald Nash kind of sums up a defense, he says, a defense shows at most that the critic of theism has failed to make his case. A theodicy, on the other hand, attempts to show that God is justified in permitting evil. And indeed, that's exactly what we're doing in this class. I, I am intending to do, I'm doing theodicy in this class. I'm showing you that I think God is 
completely justified in allowing evil. But a lot of people think that theodists are, well, even a defense, a lot of people think even a defense is difficult, but a theodicy is like, you, you really think that you can explain why God allows evil? And as I said, I've been teaching this for a long time now, and it's interesting to me, I've begun to realize, and I've, obviously I've listed them here, the reasons why people don't think God, that we can answer why God allows evil or why theodicy seems unachievable. First of all, of course, we reel from so much evil, don't we? I mean, we read the newspaper, turn on the television, and it's just one slaughter or mayhem after another, one rape, one murder, and, and on and on and on it goes. And we do, indeed as humans, we reel from so much evil. It's just, it, it's just a little bit mind-boggling. And when you see the tremendous amount of evil that's going on in the world, it's a little bit, uh, I, I can see why people go, oh man, there's just so much evil. How could God have any good reason for allowing all this evil to exist? Uh, I don't intend to offend anybody, but some people are uh, what I would just simply term spiritually lazy. And they say, oh, well, that's, you know, the heavy, big topics of God. He doesn't call me to get into that. He just calls me to love Jesus. I'm not really called to, to understand deep theological truth. And I hear this kind of thing quite often. And I'm not saying this is always the case. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes, my brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, I realize that sometimes this is because they just simply don't want to do hard work. Theologically, biblically. They don't want to really apply themselves. And it's easier, isn't it? Hey, you're just supposed to love God, man. Well, if you're just supposed to love God, man, then what are you doing in seminary? What are you doing getting a master's in apologetics? If, I mean, uh, what's the point, right? Because you just, you just go out and pray a lot and read the Bible and you're fine. But... The Lord has made a universe that's complex. A lot of things are going on in the universe. Very big things, very important things. And we need to master them, frankly. He wants us to. But it's easy to just kind of cop out on this and go, oh, well, you know, that's hard, difficult stuff. It's not for me. Another reason that people think that theodicy is unachievable, frankly, is they misunderstand the book of Job. What do you have going on in Job, by the way? Think about it just for a minute. What, what do you have going on in Job? I think most of you, I said, what's the biggest, in fact, what's the biggest lesson? Does anybody want to venture? What's the, the biggest lesson that you can think of from the book of Job? Anybody that wants to go on the record right now? Suffering. Well, right, the, it's about suffering, but what's, what's the answer what might be the answer, if you're going to say the answer on why Job suffered so much was, Jason? To bring glory back to God. To bring glory to God. I think that's very good. I, I don't think most people, I think most people would go, oh, well, we just don't know. We won't know. Because at the end of the book, the Lord says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And I think people take from that and they go, see, the answer in the book of Job is that there really is, God's not giving an answer, he's just smarter than you are and you should get over it. And I think a lot of Christians, when they read Job, they come to the conclusion that that's mostly the lesson about suffering from Job is just, you know, hey, hey God's bigger than you, he understands more than you, so just get over it. However, and, and this goes along with what Jason just said, if you read the first two chapters of Job, you are taken into an amazing conversation one of the most amazing conversations in the entirety of the Bible between God and Satan. And God says about Job, and we'll talk about Job more in the weeks to come, but God says about Job, he says to Satan, he says, have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man. And Satan says, pshaw, you've built a hedge around him, which in other words, you've made his life easy. If you make his life difficult, what? Does anybody remember? What will he do? What will Job do according to Satan? He'll curse you to your face. Make his life difficult, and he'll curse you to your face. So really, when we come to Job, it isn't just simply, oh, well, God's bigger than you, and he knows more. You're led into this dialogue in heaven that's phenomenal. And what is it about? 
if God doesn't give you everything, give Job everything he wants, then he's going to curse God. And if God takes away the things that he's given him, he's going to curse him. My fourth reason a lot of people think that theodicy, or many people think that theodicy is unanswerable, frankly, uh, as a motivating factor, is I've learned that even some Christians don't want it answered. And by that I mean a lot of people want to have something against God. They want to have, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I understand this whole God thing, but he's got a problem. He's got, you know, the God you worship, or maybe even the God I, he's got issues, you know. The God I worship has got issues. And honestly, I think, I've run into people, and I've run into even some people who call themselves Christians. I'm not saying there are Christians or not. I'm not saying they're not Christians. But who self-identify as Christians. And they go, they're, they're mad at God. And they want God to be on the hook. They don't want him to be off the hook. And so the idea that you might venture to say, hey, we know why God allows evil is angering to them because then God's off the hook. Another reason that people don't think we can understand why God allows evil is because for, they hold to exhaustive determinism. Or just determinism, exhaustive. I put that in there. It's not terribly necessary, but they hold to determinism. Now, determinism, we'll talk about this more this evening. Determinism is the belief that God determines everything you do. And when I say everything you do, I mean everything. If you go like this, God so arranged the affairs of the universe that you couldn't have not done this. If you order chocolate ice cream over vanilla, God so arranged the affairs of the universe that you couldn't have not done that. The, tr the problem is, for those who hold to determinism, that as you really embrace determinism, it's very hard to get God out of being the author of evil. And many theologians today hold that view. They, and so, they, so how do you get God out of being the author of evil if he's determined everything that exists, everything that you ever do? And we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Next, most Christians fail to understand human depravity. Clearly, very little of an idea of what human depravity is all about. Most Christians fail to understand the value of free will. That's another major thing. They do not get it. See, we pay lip service to it. In fact, I think if you, I, I've done this, if you ask most people, most Christians, say, why does God allow evil? Most of them will kind of go, well, uh, because he wanted to give creatures free will. And my response to that is, that's right but because they don't understand what free will is about, they don't understand its nature or its value or what it would be like to not have free will, because they don't understand that, that's not compelling to them. You understand? It doesn't, because they don't get it. And finally, and this is colossal, very few Christians really have a deeper, robust understanding of the glory that awaits them in eternity forever. Very few. Very, 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 very few have any kind of conception of that. We have relegated eternity as an also-ran doctrine. Eternity is now, is the PS to the Christian life. How it became the PS to the Christian life is bizarre because the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but what? Have eternal life. I mean, like the key verses that we're quoting in evangelism end with have eternal life. But so much of our evangelism, our ministry, so much of it is about three steps to better marriages, four steps to better communication, you know, five steps on, you know, how to succeed in this or that or the other thing, how to raise your children, whatever. Those things aren't wrong or bad. I'm not saying you can't teach on those things. But... Jesus did not, understand this, Jesus did not die for you so that you could have a better marriage. Do you understand that? Jesus did not die for you so that you would have a better marriage. I'm not saying you won't have a better marriage. You know, if people come to Christ, they won't have a better marriage. I, I think most of the time they will. Not all the time, though. Sometimes when people become Christians in the Middle East, in Muslim countries, their spouse divorces them or even tries to kill them, that's not an improved lifestyle, is it? That's, that, that's not, oh boy, I can't wait to do that. That's not an improved lifestyle. 
But Christianity didn't come to guarantee that you'd have a better marriage or, or that you'd even have a happier family. It didn't come to give you a more prosperous life. He didn't come to give you a more prosperous life here. He came to save you from your sins and therefore the wrath of God so that you could be adopted into his family and you could live forever and ever with him. That's what he came for. Yes, many of those other things follow, but he didn't come primarily for those things. He came so that you could be saved from your sins and know eternal life forever and ever. That's what he came for. But because Christians misunderstand this, they, suffering is unimaginable. But as somebody's put it, eternity dwarfs our suffering to insignificance. Eternity dwarfs our suffering to insignificance. But if you don't have much of a view of eternity, then that doesn't, you know, I don't know what that means, right? I mean, if you don't have much of a view of eternity, in fact, a lot, an under, I was speaking on this, uh, and an undergrad came up to me after class, and she fought back tears as she confessed to me in front of some other students that she was afraid she didn't want to go to heaven because, frankly, to her, heaven looked like an icky place to be. We're going to sit around on fluffy clouds and strum harps that we never really learned how to play, and we're going to sport flightless wings and really basically singing the choir all day doesn't sound like something, yeah, oh boy, I can't wait. And I, as I've taught this and talked to Christians, I find a lot of Christians, they're really, heaven is not something very good to them. Well, if you think heaven itself is going to be tedious, that's its own problem of evil, right? I mean, because it's like, so God's going to put us in heaven where we're going to just be bored to forever and ever. I mean, that's a problem of evil. We have to resolve that one. But if that's not the case, and I submit to you that it's not, we're going to reign with Christ forever and ever and ever. And if that's, if that's really the case, that we're going to reign with Jesus, and he's giving us the kingdom to do with what we want to do with it, well, that makes a big difference. Theodicy, you see that one of the troubles with theodicy is when you're talking about why God allows evil, you're talking about the whole of Scripture. All of it. You're, ta you're talking about why Satan and his minions fell. Why Adam and Eve's rebellion, the degradation, uh, when after Adam and Eve rebelled, the degradation of humankind. The flood, God's wiping humankind out because they completely corrupted themselves. God's then holiness and justice demonstrated through choosing Israel. God then commands Israel to destroy the Canaanites because of their evil. Then Israel basically, unfortunately, commits the sins of the Canaanites and God starts warning them, I'm coming for you because you are committing the sins of the people I told you to wipe out. Jesus, of course, comes. And what? His ministry, death, and resurrection are the good news I, and we preach the good news, and Christ returns to judge the world, and ultimately, and the saints are going to reign with him forever and ever. See, all of this relates to why God allows evil. And so, frankly, I, just recently, a Christian teacher, uh, in fact, Sunday, we were talking to this Christian teacher, and, and this Christian teacher didn't know that Paul had nothing to, nothing to say in the Gospel of John. And I think, wow, that, you know, that's not good because you should be reading the Bible more than that. Um, but see, if you're not reading the Bible very much, if you're not reading the Bible very much, well, good luck trying to understand God's grand plan in the universe, right? I mean, it's going to be a mystery. And most of the... I started to say most, and I'm going to have to stick with most. Most of the people that I know who call themselves Christians don't read the Bible very much at all. And I dare say that's your experience too. And if you don't read the Bible very much, how are you going to understand what's going on in the universe? Right? As dark is defined as the absence of light, so evil is the absence of good. Evil is very simply what ought not to be. Evil is what ought not to be. 
we have, we, we break evil down into at least two categories, two major categories. Moral evil, moral evil encompasses gossip, slander, rape, child molesting, drunk driving, torture, murder, right, and so on. And then we have natural evil, mold, cancer, tsunamis, death. By the way, so I was speaking in Northern California about a year ago, and I talked on, I was only giving like an hour and 15 minute presentation, but I mentioned the word mold. And a woman came up to me after I was done. I only talked for like an hour and 15 minutes. Like I said, I mentioned the word mold, and she comes up and she said, did you say mold? And I said, yes, I said mold. Are, did you really? Are you sure you said mold? I said, I'm absolutely positive. It's in my notes. I mean, in fact, you know, I, even when I'm not, I, even if I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, I will often just read, you know, they, they don't know I'm actually looking at slides like this, but this is what I, and I'm just paging through. I said, yeah, I, I said mold. And she says, I have become allergic to mold and it's destroying my life and I've been in a state of tremendous doubt and, and anxiety in my spiritual life and I prayed to God tonight that, that you would mention the word mold. I thought, well, that's an interesting answer to prayer that she just, that some sense that God knew that she was suffering and that I would actually mention the word, word mold. Kind of an interesting thing. Um, John Stuart Mill, when it comes to natural evil, he says, in sober truth, nearly all the things which men are hanged or imprisoned for doing to one another are nature's everyday performances, killing the most criminal act recognized by human laws. Nature does to every being that lives, and in a large proportion of cases, after protracted tortures, such as only the greatest monsters whom we've ever uh, who we read of, of ever inflicted on their fellow creatures. Nature impales men, breaks them as if on a wheel, casts them to be devoured by wild beasts, burns them to death, crushes them with stones like the first Christian martyr, starves them with hunger, freezes them with cold, poisons them by the quick and slow venom of her exaltations, and has hundreds of other hideous deaths in reserve. Uh, makes me think that uh, he's not too impressed with the being able to answer the problem of evil, eh? Charles Darwin wrote, he says, there seems to me to be too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the parasitic wasp with the express intention of their feeding within the bodies of caterpillars or that a cat should play with mice. In other words, Darwin says, I, there just can't be a good God. An all-powerful God in the universe is just, it can't be the case. So, I break it down here to three problems of evil. There's the logical problem of evil, the evidential problem of evil, and the religious problem of evil. The logical problem of evil, this is stated a whole bunch of ways, as Hume, David Hume put it, is he willing to prevent evil but not able, then he's impotent, is he able but not willing, then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? Or as I, you know, when I'm talking to groups all the time, I'll say, I'll just shorten it to, if God is all good, he'd desire to prevent evil, but if he's all, and if he's all powerful, he'd be able to prevent evil, but evil exists. So God is either not all good or not all powerful, or he just doesn't exist in the first place, right? That's the logical problem of evil. The, then there's the evidential problem of evil. And as somebody has put it, forget the logical problem of evil, I don't care about it. But does the universe with all the evil in it make sense? In other words, by the way, most atheists now are not using the logical problem of evil as evidence, as a real serious argument against Christianity. In other words, they're not using the syllogism that I just gave you uh, as evidence against Christianity. Frankly, largely because of the work of Alvin Plantinga, uh, and he's just shown simply, we can, we can get out of the logical problem, that's not an issue. But they still do appeal a lot to the evidential problem, which basically, as I said, is, well, okay, maybe we can't use the logical problem of evil, but still, look at all the evil in the world, and does it make sense? that a good God would allow this. The trouble with that, as Greg Kokel put it once, 
He says, but once you get away from the logical contradiction and you move off into just saying, well, it just seems like there's a lot of bad things happening and God shouldn't allow this, on what basis do you really have to accuse God? You see, because the logical problem of evil is, about one, uh, is, is one of inter internal contradiction. It is that as the, the Bible, what the Bible reveals about God's goodness and God's power seems to be contradicted by him allowing suffering. Okay, but so many skeptics now have said, okay, this is not going to work for us. Alvin Plantinga and others have successfully done away with the logical problem of evil. But still, there's just so much evil. But once you do this, as I said, as Greg Kokel put it, he says, but once you give this up, he says, a tsunami wipes a lot of people out to sea. Well, the crabs have a feast. What's wrong with that? Right? Because once you give up the logical problem, on what basis do you begin to accuse God? On what, you know, I mean, hey, the crabs are eating. What's wrong with the crabs eating? God's got to feed the crabs too. Yes. Is this the same thing as the probabilistic problem of evil? No. The, the probabilistic pro yeah y yes it probably is I'm not I, I don't hear that term hardly ever but yeah it's just it probably see because the logical problem of evil is one of, I mean if you could really show the the way if the way we use good and the way we use evil uh, and the way we use being omnipotent and omnibenevolent the way we use these terms is the, is the correct way then if you could show this then indeed God can't exist if the, if the only way you can use them is the way the skeptic uses them, then indeed God can't exist. But like I say, that's being given up. So then the evidential or probabilistic issue is, well, yeah, but does it just make sense? You know, I mean, pr I mean probably not, right? I mean, you look around at all the suffering in the world, probably not, right? Well, we're going to talk about that. As uh, it, Randall Keene's, Darwin's great-great-grandson put it, after Annie's death, Charles set the Christian faith firmly behind him. He did not attend church services of the family. He walked with them to the church door, but left them to enter on their own and stood talking with a village constable. Or he walked along the lanes around the parish. He did, though, still firmly believe in a divine creator. But while others had faith in God's infinite goodness, Charles found him a shadowy, inscrutable, and ruthless figure. In other words, where Darwin began to leave, well, where Darwin, not began, where Darwin, Darwin left Christianity over his daughter dying. I believe she was 10. When 10-year-old Danny died, he said, we're done with Christianity. So here's how, here's some false attempts to solve the problem of evil. <clears throat> false attempts. God is less powerful, that's a false attempt. God is less good, that's a false attempt. Contradictions are okay. That's another false attempt. Or maybe we just, the Bible's just mistaken about who God is. Let's talk about these briefly. Uh, false attempt number one, God is less powerful. Rabbi Kushner put it, uh, basically that was, you know, in Rabbi Kushner's book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? That was his basic answer. Bad stuff happens. You know, God just can't, God just can't fix it. All bad stuff happens. Uh, this is also, frankly, in, uh, this is also the trouble with Greg Boyd and open theism. Open theists are solving the problem of evil, but they've done it by having God be less powerful. And in particular, God's less powerful because he doesn't know the, f the future decisions of free beings. But see, that's, that's a, a way of saying God is less powerful than the standard Christian understanding of who God is, that God does not know the future decisions of free beings. I think that's a false start. Um, <clears throat> regarding uh, Kushner's book where he says, you know, God just can't fix it all. Ellie Wiesel, the Holocaust the survivor, Ellie Wiesel put it uh, regarding Kushner's book. He says, if that's who God is, why doesn't he resign and let someone more competent take his place? Which I think is kind of funny. <clears throat> I mean, it's like, God's doing his best, you know. I mean, basically, it's Kushner's view. God's doing his best, man. It's just, it's just, he can't do it. And so Ellie was out, man, he ought to just resign. Get, you know, let somebody else take over. Um, another attempt is God is less good. And, I, and I, this is represented actually by the, he's now passed away, <clears throat> the former diehard five-point Calvinist theologian Gordon Clark, who's a, who's a determinist, by the way. 
He said, there is no law superior to God which forbids him to decree sinful acts. God is not responsible for the sin he causes. Did you hear that? I'm, I didn't make a mistake in what I wrote here. God is not responsible for the sin he causes. God cannot be responsible for the plain reason that there's no power superior to him. No greater being can hold him accountable. No one can punish him. There is no one to whom God is responsible. There are no laws which he could disobey. Now, for most people, though, that's not a very good answer because it sounds a lot like might makes right, right? I mean, well, God's bigger than you. In fact, not only is God bigger than you, he's bigger than everybody. And because he's bigger than everybody, he can do what he wants. And he's smarter than you. Paul Helm, also a determinist in commenting on Clark, <coughs> this is what Clark said, Clark's argument is, a, is characteristic of philosophy, but extraordinary under any other circumstance. In other words, this is a sort of worldly wisdom attempt to bail out a theology. Indeed it is. I think this is just a worldly wisdom attempt to bail out a theology. Well, God's bigger and greater than you are and you don't get it tough. He's smarter than you. I mean, this is kind of, you know, the last two chapters of Job times 10. You know, you can't hold him accountable because he knows more than you. <clears throat> the trouble with that is you have a lot of verses like this. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We're supposed to love as he loves. We're supposed to do what he does. And if you say, well, but he's doing all this kinds of stuff that we can't even quantify. I mean, in other words, uh, if he's making people do all kinds of terrible acts, what does it mean to say I need to be perfect as he's perfect? In what sense? How, does that work? I think that's the problem. J.I. Packer, now here's some people attempt to do, do, deal with theodicy, and J.I. Packer is one of them. He's a great man. I, I respect him immensely, but <clears throat> I think he's desperately wrong here. He calls this an antinomy. And now an anti well, let's just read it. Packer writes, the whole point of an antinomy in theology at any rate is that it is not a real contradiction, though it looks like one. It's an apparent incompatibility between two apparent truths. An antinomy exists when a pair of principles stand side by side, seemingly irreconcilable, yet both undeniable. There are cogent reasons for believing each of them. Each rests on the clear and solid evidence, but it's a mystery to you how they can be squared with each other. You see that each must be true on its own, but you do not see how they can be true together. <clears throat> well, that gets us out of the problem, doesn't it? Just a bunch of contradictions. Or at least, I, he wouldn't say bunch, Packer. But he said, we just, there's, just some, there's just some apparent contradictions. They're not real contradictions, but they're apparent contradictions. And, oh, well, that's it. They're antinomies. Paul Helm, like I say, who's also a determinist, says, but appealing to antinomy could be a license for accepting nonsense. We would never think about it. <coughs> We would never let the cults get away with that, right? Jehovah's Witness would bring up a verse to them and they start to answer and they go, and we say, well, that you can't, how do you square that verse with this one here? Oh, that's an antinomy. It's an apparent contradiction, but not a real one. Uh, frankly, as, as Helm says, that could be a license for accepting nonsense. How do we know when something's an, only an apparent contradiction and not a real contradiction? We don't. And I think that Christian theology uh, is on the ropes. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. So, and then finally, fault starts. The non-biblical, some people just get away from Scripture. John Hicks' book, and it's a very good book, Evil and the Love of God. If we had more time and you know, like this was, a, there were more units to the course I'd assign this to, because it's a very good book. Obviously, I disagree with much of it, but it is, but he does, it's interesting to see where he goes. But Hicks' view is God is soul-making, but he comes to the conclusion that everyone's going to be saved. Everyone. Well, <clears throat> again, that's not biblical, right? I mean, that's just not biblical. Everybody's not going to be saved. Well, sure, if you're just going to get away from the Scripture and do what you want, well, it's not that easy to, or that difficult, rather. It's not that difficult to carve out 
a theodicy if you're just going to, you know, get rid of any scriptures that don't agree with what you want to believe. So here are the five major things that we're going to be doing in this class. First, and we're going to talk about this somewhat tonight, I've, I've assigned an article <coughs> I've assigned an article on this on is, is determinism scriptural? And I'll have that on Blackboard for you tomorrow. We must re you have to reject determinism if you're going to have any hope of understanding why God is allowing evil in the universe. <coughs> I'm not saying, by the way, that you have to reject election. I'm not. You can hold to election, and I, there won't be anything in my theodicy, frankly, uh, that would contradict your holding to election. But you can't hold to determinism, right? Election is just one of the thing, one of the many things for the Calvinists that God might determine. <clears throat> but uh, determinism is the view that God determines absolutely everything. That just simply has to go, and we're going to talk about that this evening. So we need to reject determinism. We need to understand our relationship to Adam. We need to understand humankind's depravity. We're going to talk about that a lot starting tonight and next week in a not very easy uh, lecture, by the way, but an important one. Then we're going to talk in, in time about free will. We're going to spend about nine hours, in other words, three classes, talking about the glory that awaits us in heaven and how that relates to what God is doing here with suffering and evil. So we're going to do a lot with this because that's a huge issue. <clears throat> By the way, I just here's my short answer. Ready? Here's my short... People go, what's the short answer? Here it is. Uh, God created humans with free will and gave them paradise, but they distrusted God and rebelled against Him, thus bringing immense suffering on themselves and others. Since the rebellion could not simply be the excuse, God died for rebellious humans, now humans who trust God learn the horror of rebellion through experiencing rebellion's devastating results. They also learn to overcome evil with good. This knowledge prepares them to be fit inheritors of God's kingdom where they will use their free will rightly in their reigning with Jesus forever and ever. So first of all, as I said, if we're going to hope to get our hands around why God allows evil, we have to reject determinism, the belief that God determines absolutely everything so that you can never do other than you do. Augustus Toplady put it in perspective. He says, not a dust, notice not a dust, flies in a beaten road, but God raises it, conducts its uncertain motion, and by his particular care conveys it to a certain place he had before appointed to it. In other words, a speck of dust... God is going there. That's exactly where I want this speck of dust to land. That's, actually, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not saying that's the way God works, but I don't have a problem with that. The trouble is, uh, it, it gets to be, <clears throat> well, as you're going to see in a minute, quite a problem. Because if you don't, if you hold to determinism, if you don't reject determinism, you are led into one of two camps. You're either led into the belief which most determinists hold of R.C. Sproul that evil is just simply unanswerable. We just will never answer it. We can't answer it. And that's why, by the way, again, why you have a lot of people, Christian leaders, going, you'll never answer why God allows evil. Well, if God determines your every thought and deed so that no one ever can do other than they do, which is what Sproul Sr. believes, by the way, well, no, I don't think you can answer why God allows evil, ever. And so you just have to conclude that evil is unanswerable. And so Sproul says, I do not know the solution to the problem of evil, nor do I know anyone else who does. Well, indeed, uh, because none of his determinist friends have ever gotten close to really giving a good answer. So he doesn't know anybody that, sol that can solve the problem if you hold that God determines everything. He doesn't, he doesn't know anybody that can solve the issue. So you either have to conclude that evil is unanswerable, or you can have, have to conclude that God's the cause of evil, and that's what Gordon Clark, who we just talked about a minute ago, does. He says, I wish very frankly and pointedly to assert that if a man gets drunk and shoots his family, it was the will of God that he should do it. 
let it be unequivocally said that this view certainly makes God the cause of sin. And you'll remember the answer I read when you go, well, that just doesn't seem very good. Hey, who are you to talk to God, man? He's big, you're little, no laws over him, nobody can hold him to account. And so that's, that's just, in other words, you know, just God causes evil, get over it. <coughs> By the way, I had R.C. Sproul's son, R.C. Sproul Jr., on the radio with me when I had my radio program. And he disagreed with his father and agreed with Gordon Clark. So, oh, no, I, God's the cause of evil. He just has to be. You know, it's the only, just in his mind, it was just honest. The trouble is, here's where it gets really natty. If God determines every thought and deed that everyone ever thinks or does, then the man who tortures to death the little girl next door could not have done otherwise. He couldn't have not tortured her to death. So to make it really sickening, so every burn, every cut, every penetration, every humiliation that he does to this little girl, God so arranged the affairs of the universe that he couldn't have not done those things. Well, it's hard to get, you know, say that God, well, you have to do what Sproul does. You have to do either what Sproul or Clark does. You either have to go, I don't know the answer, and then maybe go with Packer. It's an antinomy, an apparent contradiction, but not a real one. Well, what, how do we know when it's a real one and just an apparent one, though? Well, uh-oh. Or you have to go with Clark and go get over it. God can do whatever he wants. But you have to go down one of those two routes. And strangely, though, you'll find determinists writing a lot of theodicy. But it doesn't work very well to them, <clears throat> for them. And I really encourage you, my determinist friends, I don't know, there, there might be some in this class. We have, you know, we, we have students coming in here that are determinists. I humbly encourage you to rethink this. I really do. I humbly encourage you to rethink this. I'm not saying, let me say it again, you don't have to give up election. Because God can determine some things and not everything. But if God determines everyone's thought and deed so that no one can ever do other than they do, if he's doing that, then like I say, when a guy tortures to death a little girl next door, God so arranged the affairs of the universe that that man couldn't have not tortured that little girl to death. And you're just never going to get out of the problem. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to go through... Uh, I will, briefly. They, the terminus will quote verses like this. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Well, sure, God determines some things. And it isn't difficult for him to find somebody who will act like Judas acted. We know Judas was never a Christian. Remember, it says in John, he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He was never really a disciple. He was a disciple in name only. He wasn't really a disciple. It isn't God for... God can take the affairs of free beings and work them into his overall plan. Uh, they'll quote Daniel 4.35, Nebuchadnezzar praises God whose dominion is eternal and he does what he pleases. Who doesn't agree with that? I do. Of course God's dominion is eternal and he does what he pleases. They, uh, they misunderstand the genre of Proverbs when they quote Proverbs 16.9, the mind of man plans his way but the Lord directs his steps. It's a misunderstanding of the genre of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is not a bunch of absolute truisms. It's a bunch of general principles about how life tends to work out. In fact, if it were absolutely everyone always was 100% true all the time, you'd run into Proverbs like this one. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Well, Jesus' ways please the Lord, right? We agree with that. Were Jesus' enemies at peace with him? Not any time that we know of. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. I don't think he, that verse was talking about ballroom dancing, but like I say, it's a misunderstanding of the genre of Proverbs. Proverbs are just general statements that God is generally in the charge of the affairs of humans. <clears throat> They'll quote also Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lamp, but its every decision is of the Lord. 
I, do you think that's talking about Yahtzee or is it talking about, does this concern God's guidance after prayer for important decisions like choosing an apostle in Acts 1? It's probably, that's what it means, right? The lot is cast. Remember they cast lots for an apostle after prayer? That's probably what this verse is talking about and not Yahtzee, right? <clears throat> now you can say, no, it's talking about Yahtzee too, but you're doing that only if you already assume determinism is true. You're not getting it from this verse. Ephesians 1.11, this is the key verse uh, on this subject. Also, we've obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of who, him, his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. John Feinberg calls this perhaps the clearest expression of the notion of divine determinism. According to this verse then, believers are predestined to salvation in accord with the purpose of God, and God does all things, including predestining to salvation according to the counsel of his will. The clause then broadens the scope of the verse to speak not only over election, but over all else, everything, over all else. In other words, Feinberg is saying this verse teaches that God determines everything that ever happens because he determines all things. But that's not the way the word all works. Think about it. If somebody, all things always carries with it unstated assumptions. A church volunteer says, I will do anything you want. There's an unstated assumption there that it won't be immoral or illegal, right? But, well, wait, no, she said she'll do every, all. I'll do anything you want. Well, there's an unstated assumption that it won't be immoral or illegal. Colossians 1.11 says, all things were created through him. Do we believe that Baal and pornography were created through Christ? No, I, I don't think so. 1 Peter 4.7 says, the end of all things are near. But certainly, we, it doesn't mean the end of God, or his angels, or the saints, right? Their end isn't near. Perhaps the working of all things may include the working of the actions of creatures who could do otherwise into his final plan. And that's, I think, the answer. <clears throat> I'm Here's a verse, one of the strongest, stronger verses against the idea that God determines everything. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. <clears throat> but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. See, the trouble with this for determinists is, you know, I've debated several determinists. I'm not going to mention their names, but I've debated several determinists on the radio. And it was a friendly debate. I mean, I respect them. I think they respected me, but we disagreed. But I bring this verse up, and one of them, who's actually really pretty famous, uh, I said, if God determines everything so I can never do other than I do, then when I sin, could I have not sinned? Did I have the choice to not sin when temptation came upon me? And frankly, I went home afterwards and I listened to his answer to that again and again and again. I kept playing it back and I kept going, and I tried to write it down. And frankly, it made no sense to me at all. I, I never understood what the answer to it was. Th think about this. If God has determined every Christian's every sin so that no Christian can do otherwise, what is their way of escape from every or any sin, right? How can, you, how can the scripture say there will be a way of escape if God has determined that you will do it. Believe me, if God has determined, if he has determined that you will do something, there's no way of escaping it, right? So if God has determined your every thought and deed, and that would also mean your every sin, but that means when you sin, you couldn't have not sinned. So how can the verse say, you will never be tempted beyond what you're able if you could never do other than you did? Because this verse really is saying that no cause or set of causes that encourage a Christian to sin is so strong that the Christian could not do otherwise, and yet Christians sometimes sin. And by the way, I've asked determinists when I've talked to them face to face. I've said, so, has there ever been a time in your life when you've lusted, 
whether after people, possessions, positions, or pleasures, when you've lusted, that you could have not lusted. And I'm telling you, it's try it sometime. If you're talking to a determinist, try it. See what I say. Is there ever been a time then, Mr. Determinist or Ms. Determinist or whatever, has there ever been a time when you've sinned when you could have not sinned? I've not yet had a determinist say, no, every time I've ever sinned, I had to sin. I think, honestly, it's the Holy Spirit inside of them, frankly, because I think the Holy Spirit's going, don't you dare say that every time you sinned, you always had to sin. Because, but, but understand something. If determinism is true, every time you sin, you had to sin. You couldn't have not sinned. Well, what, is, what do we do with 1 Corinthians 10, 13 then? I mean, how do you... Also, Romans 6, 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not let the parts of your body... Or do not offer the parts of your body as to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall have no dominion, or not be your master. I'm reading in a different translation in my mind. For sin will not be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. Isn't this verse also saying you don't have to sin? Well, when you do sin, could you have not sinned? But see, the trouble if you believe, if determinism is true, you always have to sin when you sin. When you committed a sin, you couldn't have not done it because God has always determined your every thought and deed. A tremendous amount of theologians hold this view. R.C. Sproul, J.I. Packer, and a host of others. Because they hold this view, they basically come down the line of what... Uh, Sproul said, where he said, I do not know the solution to the problem of evil, nor do I know anyone else who does. Because you can't answer it and hold the determinism. In fact, doesn't the most unforced reading of every New Testament command to the Christian suggest that the Christian can do other than sin? When you read the New Testament, my brothers and sisters, in Christ, and you're thinking this through, isn't your takeaway the most unforced reading that the New Testament is telling me as a Christian that when I sin, I don't have to? I, I don't know. You know, sure is for me. Okay, a little joke. Uh, Dilbert, I like Dilbert. Does anyone know the root cause of our project's failure, asks the boss. Dilbert says, I'm a determinist, so I'd have to say the problem goes back to the origin of the universe. Boss says, why are you like this? My cubicle destroyed my illusion of free will. Now that's good because they actually do consider free will to be an illusion. It's a really strange thing that they think free will is illusory. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.